times of their creation, the maps show the diverse geography of Italy, islands, mountains, lakes and cities. These are bird's eye view paintings as if someone was looking at Italy from the sky. You may stop and take a look at the 16th century Rome and see the destroyed Colosseum. Some maps were painted with a particular reference to Rome, the abode of the Pope. On the map of Sicily, the image of the island is not oriented from the north to the south. The reference points for the map is not the north, but the Pope, looking at the island from Rome, southwards, downwards. So the map of Sicily is painted upside down. Major battles and political events are recorded in miniature on many maps. Here we have Hannibal with elephants defeating Romans by Lake Ticino. Art and science combined make the gallery one of the most beautiful places of the Vatican museums. Each map is connected to frescoes on the ceiling of the gallery, painted by Girolamo Muziano. They depict saints and the miracles they worked at, the places shown on the maps below. Here we have Saint Anthony preaching to the fish near Rimini, capital of Flaminia, painted below. It is an example of the artist's conviction that each region of Italy is filled up with God's grace via saints. The specific film-like quality of the gallery instills the feeling of triumph. When they started to paint the gallery, the church was rising after the sack of Rome and successfully struggling with problems brought about by the Reformation. It helped effectively to fight off the landing of the Turks in Malta and contributed to the victory of the Battle of Lepanto, eternized at the end of the gallery. The two battles saved both the Catholic and Protestant Europe from the Turkish invasion. The maps symbolize the unity of Italy. Regions of the peninsula are bonded by the two seas. During the Reformation, all those city-states remained loyal to the church. Despite political and geographical divisions, Italy was united by its faith. Similarly to the triumphant Caesar striding along Via Sacra, the Pope would pace up and down the gallery as the spiritual leader of the world represented on its walls. A new spirit of art permeated Rome toward the end of the 16th century. After a hard struggle to survive, art found a new and noble part in the life of the church. The church encouraged artists to be quiet preachers of the people, but very few would respond to the invitation as effectively as Michelangelo Marisi called Caravaggio. The Entombment of Christ, painted by Caravaggio in 1603, draws our attention immediately. Christ's body is about to be placed in the tomb. Caravaggio does not distract the viewer. The painting focuses on this event only. The comforting details of the Renaissance landscape disappear. Christ's body is hanging inertly just in front of our eyes. His arm imitating, in a way, the gesture from the famous Pieta by Michelangelo is hanging inertly down while the three fingers resting on the marble block remind that Christ would spend no more than three days in the tomb. is looking at Christ. We are absorbed by Mary's sadness, woman's tears, and men's effort. The entombment of Christ was originally commissioned as an altarpiece. When pilgrims stopped at the chapel, they had the impression that Christ's body hovered over the altar. 
confirming the real presence in the Eucharist, the cornerstone of the Catholic Church's teaching. With the splendid chiaroscuro and perfect composition, Caravaggio became a seducer of souls, whose art is still appealing even nowadays. At the beginning of the 18th century, when art proved an excellent means of communication with the faithful, the church realized that it could be a wonderful opportunity for dialogue with people of other religions. Increasing interest in the beauty and history of the ancient world established bonds between the church and the people who were more and more educated. In the Age of Enlightenment, popes opened their sumptuous collections of works of ancient art, not only for pilgrims but also for tourists, who came to Rome to see the ruins of the Colosseum and other major monuments of the classical era. Pope Clemens XIV and Pius VI organized the collection of Julius II. In the Sala della Biga, resembling Roman hot springs, Pope Pius VI put his collection of statues of athletes. A marble chariot with two dashing horses becomes more to the movie screen than to a papal art gallery. The proud and naked sportsmen seem columns supporting this round temple of victory. Wrestlers, runners and discus throwers proclaim the earthly glory. The rushing quadriga is near the finish line. What could link those figures, so filled up with earthly beauty and fitness, to the church? This room praises victory more than sports. Palm leaves and gold medals of the antiquity define the sportsmen as winners, the fastest, the strongest, and the most persistent. The chariot becomes a metaphor of life, rushing through adversities to its end. Perceiving the paradise as the final victory, Christians could have easily included the Roman affection for sport in their teaching. St. Paul writes in his first letter to the Corinthians, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. The Pio Clementino Museum was immensely successful, perhaps too successful. Just after it was opened, the wave of the French Revolution flowed over the Alps and spread all over Italy. A disaster followed the Peace of Tolentino, which allowed Napoleon to carry away thousands of works of art from papal collections to his new Louvre Museum. The most dramatic fate in this artistic diaspora was the story of the famous painting Jerome by Leonardo da Vinci, lost, damaged and found during the tempestuous years of the French Revolution. Leonardo painted Jerome as a penitent in the desert, his body emaciated because of fasting. The subtle drawing of Jerome's body indicates Leonardo's knowledge of the human body. The lion crouching down at Jerome's feet is the saint's attribute. In that turbulent period, Jerome was lost as many other works of art and was not found then. It was found at the study of a Swiss painter, Angelica Kaufmann, but went missing again after her death in Rome in 1807. A part of the painting was recovered by Napoleon's uncle, Cardinal Fesch. 
According to tradition, the fragment with Jerome's head was used as upholstery for a stool. Scars to be seen on Jerome's body are nothing else but visible marks of wounds inflicted to art by war. The 19th century found the Papal Museum empty, but Pope Pius VII Chiaramonti competently remedied painful losses, filling up the vacant pedestals. Taking a keen interest in a new science of archaeology, Pius VII supported evacuations in the Papal State. He was devoted to the restoration and renovation of many destroyed edifices and statues. The Colosseum was restored owing to him. Taxes which Napoleon imposed on Roman aristocracy led to mass sales of land, buildings and art collections. Many works of art got to museums opened in European capitals. Spending all the money he had, Pius VII would buy them and bring them back to Rome. The works he recovered, often damaged or of poor quality, were gathered in a museum named after him, the Museo Chiaramonti. Likenesses of gods, emperors and Romans look at us, each ready to tell its story from the past. The persistence of Pius VII was rewarded. Napoleon was defeated, and the Pope sent Antonio Canova, sculptor and superintendent of antiquities, on a mission to Paris to recover the robbed works of art. After a number of failures and adventures, Canova did bring back many robbed objects. The collection was expanding, but the space was shrinking. In 1822, Pius VII commissioned a new wing for the museum. The project turned to set trends in the development of future exhibition rooms in modern Europe. They engaged a team of museum guards who would wear uniforms and receive regular wages and pensions. Canova fixed opening hours and days off duty. The museum was rising like a phoenix from the ashes, ready to face the new times. In the Braccio Nuovo, the new wing opened by Pius VII in 1822, the elegant interior design and